Today on Earth Focus, chemical pollution, an American city fights back, and the toxic legacy of gold mining in Peru. Coming up on Earth Focus. On a warm summer night, you can see why many choose to live in Toms River, New Jersey. Riverboats, beaches, the promise of relaxing days and good health. But 40 years ago, the town became famous for a very different reason, chemical pollution and cancer. We had no idea that they were discharging toxic chemicals. They never should have let the people of the Taz River drink that water. I know where my son's cancer came from. The company got caught. It's part of the duty of government to protect public health, and that didn't happen enough. It happened here, it could really happen anyplace. The chemical history of Tom's River began in 1952 when Siba Geige, a chemical dye company, built an industrial manufacturing plant. There wasn't a lot happening in Tom's River. The economy was uh, moribund. Chicken farming was the biggest industry. There was a little bit of tourism, but not much. So when this very large chemical concern said, hey, we want to build a factory to make dyes in your town, the people in Tom's River were thrilled. The company brought jobs but it also brought a reputation of poor waste management practices. It was very clear, as with most of the major dye manufacturers in that era, that they had big issues with pollution and public health. They created contamination problems wherever they went, and SIBA was no exception. Between 1952 and 1966, SIBA Geige legally dumped solid and liquid waste from the manufacturing process on 20 sites on the plant's property. And on days when the plant was operating, over five million gallons of chemical waste were dumped directly into the river. These were days when the philosophy of out of sight, out of mind, passed for proper waste disposal. Don Bennett grew up in Tom's River and swam in the river as a young boy, just downstream from where the plant dumped. It was bizarre to a teenage kid swimming in what looked to be just another river. The water was always ice cold, even in the middle of the summer. When you came over here to Swinging Bridge, which was a, a, a popular swimming place with young people, if your nose was working and, and your eyes were working, you would certainly recognize that something was really wrong. Don's connection to Tom's River isn't just the water. For over 30 years, he worked at the local newspaper and was one of the first reporters to investigate C. Bagaigi's chemical dumping. The estimate early on, according to the report that C. Bagaigi commissioned, uh, was that about uh, a million gallons a day was seeping in the seepage pits that they had created on the plant site. That was going into the groundwater. That was a million gallons, and they thought that was 40% of the waste they were creating every day. The rest, the 60%, was being uh, discharged directly into this river. When they came here in 1952, there wasn't anybody nearby to, to notice as the Garden State Parkway brought more and more people to the area and more and more homes were built closer to the plant. More people became aware of the, the nighttime odors that sometimes you had to close your windows. They were so obnoxious. The plant was portrayed by the local politicians as a good neighbor and there was supposed to be no problems with it. So yeah, we felt fairly safe moving in because the political structure said it was safe. The fence is the boundary of the Shibagaigi property, and you can see uh, in the background the proximity of some of the homes along Cardinal Drive. The homes you see were all built uh, long after Shibagaigi began its uh, chemical dye making here, and I would venture that most of the people who bought here had no idea uh, who their neighbor was. I mean, there was no requirement to disclose anything in, in those days. Part of the reason Siba chose to move to this area was the ideal conditions for dumping waste, sandy soil in the nearby river. But that also made the area great for finding fresh drinking water. 
The water provider, Tom's River Water Company, supplied the entire township from a shallow well field just two miles downstream from the plant. If you lived in town and were a customer of the water company, it was quite possible you would drink whatever contaminants Seba was dumping into the ground and river. We had evidence by 1964 they had contaminated the Holly Street well field. The summer of 1965 was particularly dry. The demand for water was high. The water company chose to continue operations despite warnings of contamination, which both the water company and Seba Geige concealed from the public. The following year, Seba Geige obtained a permit from the U.S. Corps of Engineers to construct a 10-mile pipeline. For the first time, they could dump their chemical waste directly into the ocean. Seba thought that their troubles were over but the chemical problems in Tom's River continued to grow. The second big thing that happened in Tom's River that's, that's germane to this story is that illegal dumpers started coming down to central and southern New Jersey, where there was lots of open space and not a lot of people watching, carrying trucks with uh, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of barrels of hazardous waste that they didn't want to dispose of legally because it was too expensive. There was one very fateful illegal dumping incident that occurred in the uh, early 1970s in the back two acres of a chicken farm. This trucker took several thousand rusting barrels of hazardous waste from Union Carbide in the North Jersey, and he just started digging trenches in the back of this chicken farm and dumping these barrels, many of which were already coming apart. And Union Carbide did not take a lot of interest in what this guy was doing. They were happy to be rid of their barrels. In just three months, September to November 1971, over 5,000 barrels were illegally dumped. That December, the culprits were arrested for dumping without a permit. But it took another seven months before the barrels were removed from the ground by Union Carbide. No other efforts were taken to clean the site. That summer, of 1972, the water company added six new wells, a mile south of Reich Farm. For the next 12 years, Tom's River would remain a normal American town. Better highways and attractive beaches encouraged population growth. But for some families, cancer was causing their worst nightmare. I was 30 when I had Michael. You know, the first 30 years of our lives, we're carefree, like any young couple, you know, trying to pay your bills, enjoy life and doing things. And then you get a child that has cancer and your whole life changes completely. It now is surrounded and revolves around your child that is sick. I was diagnosed with neuroblastoma, which is a cancer of the sympathetic nervous system and uh, still have effects of it today. Michael is alive, he's a miracle. He's received the last rites many times. He's 34 years old, um, has very limited um, normalcy to his life. The tumor is pushing my spine pretty much out of my body, like it's wearing away the skin. Um, it's also, encompass, like it wraps around like all my organs, my heart, lungs, kidneys, all that. And there's no surgical way to remove it, uh, it without me either bleeding out on the table or becoming a vegetable, I was told. I would buy the powdered Enfamil or Similac and I would mix it with the tap water. And so everything that my son got was mixed from the Tom's River tap water. I really believe that that's where his cancer came from. In the late 70s, when Michael was first diagnosed, there initially was no connection made to the drinking water. It wasn't until a dramatic day in 1984 that would spur Linda and many others in the community to investigate their water quality. Seba's ocean pipeline that had now been operating for 18 years burst at the intersection of Bay and Vaughan, right in the middle of one of Tom's River's busiest intersections. 
the stink of the pipe's effluence couldn't be ignored. There were a lot of people who were new to this area and weren't even aware that this pipeline existed. And the reality was that the pipeline ran from the Tom's River Chemical Plant, 10 miles across the mainland of Tom's River and then out into the ocean, into some of the most heavily used tourist beaches along the East Coast. It was the leak herd round the world, as I have sometimes described it, because it mobilized the citizenry both here and on the beach. And what began that April day uh, still hasn't stopped. Journalists, including Don, took the break as a reason to further investigate the chemical life of Tom's River. And for the first time, Seba's plant and the dumping at Reich Farm were called to public attention. The people in the town started to realize that something was going on. Uh, that was within the first two years after the pipeline break. It was probably more than 10 years before we understood the full consequences of what was going on. Between 1986 and 1996, the facts slowly emerged about the chemical pollution, all while more kids got cancer. My third daughter was born in 1989, and uh, unfortunately she became sick relatively quickly. Uh, when she was about 10 months old, we had discovered that uh, she uh, had cancer and unfortunately only survived till she was 14 months old. At that time in 1990 when she passed away, there was really not a thought that it was related to you know, any type of environmental causes. By this time, Linda Gillick had started her own cancer assistance nonprofit, Ocean of Love. And it was her early observations of cancer in the community that drove further investigation. I put up a map of the whole county so that we could see where our children were located for our caseworkers. And as the years went on, we noticed that Tom's River had become one big dark area full of pens. It was a big concern. And I did reach out to the state health department numerous times and told them of my concerns and was told over and over again that there was not a problem. Uh, only later in the 90s, the mid-90s, you know, was there more and more information that was coming out that, uh, you know, some of the water supply had been contaminated with uh, certain chemicals. 1996 was particularly crucial for the people of Tom's River. The state health authorities reported the rate of childhood brain and central nervous system cancer was excessive. Tom's River was now a town with a cancer cluster. About 69 families, 69 children and their parents, they are usually considered the cluster. What epidemiology tells us is that in a community, there may be an unusual pattern of disease, either defined in space, geographically, or in time, or both, over a period of time. And when that happens, we call it a cluster. And a cluster is a clue, it's a piece of evidence that something may be happening in that community. So that's what happened in Tom's River. Because of the unusual number of rare childhood cancers, the community demanded answers and the finger pointed back to both Seba Geige and the toxic waste drums Union Carbide dumped at Reich Farm. A decade earlier, two wells south of Reich Farm had actually been tested, and trichloroethylene, a common groundwater contaminant, was found. Once that TCE was found in the Parkway Wellfield coming from Reich Farm, uh, the government absolutely dropped the ball. They never should have let the people of Dover Township, Tom's River, drink that water unfiltered. The EPA and Union Carbide adopted a remediation plan. Reich Farm is a Superfund site. By law, they're supposed to have a remediation plan. Here's the remediation plan. We will let these chemicals go into the public drinking water supply and aerate them out, and then the water will be safe to drink. Someone said, why don't we put carbon filters on that water just to make sure nothing gets through. They said, it's going to aerate out. You don't need carbon filters. Well, that was a mistake that cost lives because 
it turns out the only thing in the water was not TCE. There was a lot of other stuff in the water that they weren't looking for because they weren't on EPA's priority pollutant list. So this goop included something called the styrene acrylonitrile trimer, the styrene acrylonitrile dimer. Now both styrene and acrylonitrile are thought to cause cancer. They just let it go through and it went through for 10 years and it wasn't until a big fuss was picked, kicked up over the high rate of childhood cancer that they took another look at the water and they found the sand trimer. So that's a critical fact of what happened in Tonsra. That's a lesson every community needs to learn. You know, you may think you're safe, you're not safe because there may be things in there you're not looking for. The priority pollutant list EPA has is very limited. In 1996, when these cancer-causing chemicals were found, all eight wells at the Parkway well field were shut down. It was the first step in cleaning up the pollution. Over the next five years, Union Carbide would install carbon filters on the wells near Reich Farm. A settlement would be reached by the families considered part of the cancer cluster, and Siba Geige would pay $92 million to begin a 30-year process of making the contaminated groundwater safe. Today, Tom's River water is clean, but the mistakes made and the lessons learned should not be ignored by other communities. The overall societal cost and actual dollar cost would have been a lot less if back in the 70s we said, we had a problem here, we can't keep this well field anymore. You know, chemical companies, you know, it may be a big dollar item right now, but you're gonna have to fund moving this well field to another spot. That's not what was done here. And, you know, I think that the overall you know, citizens of Tom's River paid a very heavy price over that 40-year span. You need to have tests and you need to have levels of safety for all of these chemicals that we're ingesting. As long as we do not have this information and regulations on these thousands of chemicals that are being ingested all over the country in water supplies, we are not going to be able to protect the future of this country, of these children. No corporation, no you know, politician is bigger than a combined voice you know, of, of people. When, when people join together and, and form their voices into one loud, we're not gonna stand for this. There's no standing up against that. Chemical pollution isn't limited to industrialized nations. In Peru, South America, mercury poisoning is impacting human health. And it's the mining of gold that's driving this contamination. A new film, Amazon Gold, documents a deadly twist in man's quest for gold. The jungle begins to get patchier and then patchier and then patchier. And soon it's just a little chunks of trees there, chunks of trees there, and it's mud. We can hear a motor down somewhere over there. So we walk across this hill and we come upon this enormous hole. Illegal gold mining is an issue that has hit big time uh, the image of Peru and the concerns of the, of the government. Mercury is one of the most toxic natural substances that we know of. The amount of mercury that goes into gold mining in Madre de Dios is estimated to be on the order of about 30 tons per year. That's a tremendous amount of mercury. The issues that you see today with gold mining are not that different with the drug trade. Illegal logging, illegal gold mining and drug trafficking, the three of those mafias are tied together. We went down to have a look at gold mining because gold mining is one of the underlying uh, things that's destroying this enormous intact rainforest. Well, we 
we're seeing here is an example of something that's happening all along the Amazon. We're seeing a boom of gold extraction. Amazing. It has taken the miners a week to destroy a habitat that took millions of years to evolve. For every ounce of gold extracted, the miners add an equal amount of mercury. The metal mercury is generally a liquid, and it has a particular affinity for gold. Poured into a slurry with tiny flecks of gold, the mercury binds to them, making them easy to retrieve. Mercury poisoning affects the human body by affecting the nervous system. When you have high levels of mercury that are in the blood, the hair, the urine, which are the major bioindicators, it indicates that there's uh, going to be effect on the brain. People have lower IQ levels. Uh, they have uh, balance issues. They have aggressiveness issues. They have problems with hearing, with sight, uh, taste. Much of the mercury that's used in the process of concentrating that gold is lost. It's dumped into the rivers and lakes of the area that, uh, that you have the mining. Mercury has the unusual ability of concentrating and magnifying in the food chain. And as it moves up the food chain, as one animal eats another, in this case fish, it concentrates, uh, it accumulates. They have concentrations that are millions or tens of millions of times higher than the water that they live in. It's a perfect mechanism to be able to concentrate in a form that affects the next consumer. In many cases, those are people. The Carnegie Institution for Science has conducted research in Mayo since 2008. We found that the levels of mercury have been increasing in line with the amount of gold production that has been occurring in the region. In a study that was published uh, in March 2013, we found that in the city of Puerto Maldonado, the capital of Mar de Dios, that 60% of the species that are sold in the food markets in Puerto Maldonado exceed uh, EPA limits for safe consumption of fish because of mercury. The problem is a very difficult one because it is not just an environmental problem or an economic problem, but a social problem. These are people that are poor subsistence farmers trying to find a better life and taking advantage of the opportunities that they have, namely that the price of gold is nearly at an all-time high. They're using the technology that they have available which is one that's been used for nearly 2,000 years. But they are unaware of the price that they pay for doing this, not just for themselves, but for the animals uh, and plants that are affected. Because of the economic uh, opportunities, uh, no one wants to hear bad news about something that's making them hundreds of times more money than they did the year before. This is a very bizarre scene. Wait a second. Holy cow. Wait a second. This is a Brazilian tree. Holy cow. Yeah. This is a Brazilian tree. And this tree has no future. It's just at the edge, it's gonna fall down very soon. Suddenly the light comes in, and it was wow. one of these, I don't know, it's, it's one of the most surreal uh, experiences I ever had in my life. And the part that was actually breaking my heart big time was that I'm an ornithologist, and you know, I know the birds call, the bird calls one by one. And in this place, we were looking at this hole, and there are all these machines, and all this surreal world, and, and uh, it's just, hell and behind me I hear all the birds I know singing defending territories and that was really moving. Cool. 
there is a message of hope, and uh, that's one of the things I want to emphasize, is that when you see the movie, you may get the, the feel of hopelessness. And truly speaking, there is a good reason to be hopeful. Three weeks ago, uh, there were pacific demonstrations of people, peasants, in the streets, which paralyzed a, a very important economic center in Peru, Puno, which is just south from where the movie takes place. This is the first time there are people demonstrating pacifically you know, and paralyzing a city, demanding action. And this is a very strong signal of hope. And that's something that is motivating me big time, because this is what is going to make the change. Airwaves, a global channel of uncompromising stories. World news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.